Kicking off the list at number 10, the Battle of Hastings. Okay, we look back at jesters and jugglers of the Dark Ages, and we laugh. We chuckle a little bit, rightfully so. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. It was one of the best jobs to have, despite how, you know, Game of Thrones made jesters look. It was an honorable job. The fool's payment also was no joke, my friend. Roland Le Petour was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, so long as he kept farting and juggling. Not, not a bad gig. Don't let looks deceive you, however. During the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, it had one of the most badass minstrels I have ever heard of. No jokes with this guy, that's for sure. Now, for starters, this was the same battle where William the Conqueror defeated King Harold. Historic, of course. One of the bloodiest battles in history. How it all began, though. William's minstrel, his fool, sang at English troops while he was juggling his sword around. He was singing, he was doing a little show. He's juggling and saying some probably nasty things. That's when an English soldier came forward to challenge Taylor Fair, and then he was promptly killed. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in history. Yeah, he taunted them until they made the first move. Is that allowed? I'd be so upset. I'd be upset. Number nine, Malin Matt's daughter. On part one, we had a few cases where women were found guilty of practicing witchcraft. Of course. Now, this was a common theme for the Dark Ages, sadly, but it's one thing for a town to randomly turn against you out of the blue because they're spooked, whatever the case, but imagine your family, someone who actually knows you. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody in town that she was a witch. Yeah, she was the last victim of the Great Swedish Witch Hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Mm, no way, she's like, nope, I'm not a witch. That's it. She didn't cry out in pain, she didn't beg for forgiveness, anything like that. She said it was all hogwash and she stood by it quietly. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so she too met a similar fate. Don't talk smack about your mothers. Number eight, toilet trouble. What a transition. Here on Bumblebee, we've talked a lot of smack about ancient toilets. God, they were so bad, I can't. I, I would never, I would hold it for 36 years. Apparently, these things could also take lives, yeah. In the middle of the summer, nobody around you, you could have been a victim to a medieval toilet. Yeah, how does that happen? Let's talk about it. In 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan, he went out to the cesspit and the guy sadly fell in. Now, normally you could just crawl back out, sure, but this fateful day, Duncan was quite intoxicated. Poor Poor guy suffocated in his own, what a horrible way to go out. One of the worst ways to go out. Number seven, pole vaulting. This is one of the most impressive sports to exist. We do not talk about pole vaulting enough. Pole vaulting is insane. Just guy with a stick over a building, are you kidding? That's, that's Mario physics. Today we admire athletes like Sweden's Armand Mondo Duplantis. This guy broke the world record at the 2020 Olympics. He leaped over six meters with a stick. Back in the dark ages, however, this was not a sport. No, this was your commute. The day pole vaulting was born was supposedly Christmas Day, December 25th, 1521. A Christmas miracle. Now we have pole vaulting. A laborer named Robert Baker was heading home from the church. It was Christmas, he was tired. He decided to take a shortcut over a pond, so he grabbed a long pole and Voila, he just made it. Now, don't try this. We don't recommend this as a travel option, obviously, because later on, Baker's pole ended up snapping mid-leap and then he ended up drowning, sadly, yeah. The poor guy bridged to Terabithia himself, so I wouldn't recommend pole vaulting. Number six, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the iron throne, although I'm sure that seat isn't quite comfortable either. I have a funny back, you know, I have to, I gotta sit, ooh. That's where we go. Here to crack in the mic. The iron chair was a device used in medieval punishments. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say, but this one seems more tame compared to some of the other devices used, you know? Like I mentioned the ducking stool in part one. That was, that was bad. This one's more Viking. This one's actually pretty brutal. These spikes don't look like much upon first glance, but they easily can poke through your skin. The chair is actually designed to pierce through the skin without hitting any vital organs. So you had to sit still. Definitely had to sit still. You know, I actually lied to you guys. The more I explain this one, the more I think it's the worst of the worst. I guess this is why they call it the Dark Ages. Oh my gosh. 
Number five, no birds at the funeral. If you ever want to liven up a funeral, try bringing a parrot. They love to heckle, turns out. Former President Andrew Jackson, he passed away a long time ago. He passed away in 1845. Now, it's important to note that he passed away before his pet did. He passed away before his pet parrot died. So the parrot, of course, attended the funeral, right? How lovely, right? I bet after I said that, you said, oh, maybe you gave it a thumbs up, maybe you subscribed. Good stuff going around, right? It's lovely. Thing is, the parrot loved to swear. Yeah, you had a few curse words in his back pocket. This parrot actually heckled so much during the funeral that they had to remove it. How epic is that? It got kicked out like it was a comedy club. They're like, all right, put your wings behind your little bird neck. We're out of here. Number four, illegal pedestrian crossing. I see this far too often living in the city. Toronto is wild for this. It drives me crazy. People jaywalking. Looks like there's not a truck coming your way. They do that little wave, a little smile, a little weird walk, and they just go wherever they want. Middle of a Toronto intersection. They're like, hey, I'm 92. See ya. Everyone's slamming their brakes, avoiding them all of a sudden. You're holding up traffic even more. Now, in China, jaywalking, that's a no-go. Article 40 of Beijing's traffic law stipulates that drivers in motor vehicles cannot suddenly stop even if it's at a crosswalk. So yeah, you can't even stop when you're at a crosswalk. You have to wait for cars. So if you're not in a car, you have to wait. You don't get the right of way automatically, like, you know, most of the time. And for drivers, it's forbidden to stop at these crossings. You gotta just keep going. If you do, you're getting a fine. Hopefully just a warning, but possibly a fine for stopping at a crosswalk. How insane is that? Number three, raining coffee. The sky is falling. Sometimes it's frozen lizards and sometimes it's bugs. But you know what? Sometimes maybe coffee will fall from the sky. I don't know. Get your mugs ready. We're waking up early tomorrow. I don't know. Back in 1969, a South Carolina factory was busy. The non-dairy creamer, Cremora, was doing great production-wise, but they didn't have the greatest air vents in the factory. All of a sudden, the powder mixture leaked out one day, went into the air, where it then mixed with falling rain, and... Voila, now we have double doubles falling from the clouds. Now we have a really odd rainfall. Chester, South Carolina. It was the day we woke up to coffee goop on our lawns instead of dew. That's memorable for sure. The company ended up paying a fine of $4,000 for allowing their product to be released from the plant. Could have been worse, could have been a lot worse. Could have been a spider factory, I don't know. First thing I can think of. Number two, they can't stop all of us. Remember that Area 51 raid that went down back in 2019? Months of planning, gathering heads, planning trips, renting cars, all to get everyone out to Nevada. Everyone was determined to find out the truth about aliens. It was a big raid where everyone planned to overthrow every Area 51 guard. So, did it work? What ended up happening there? I forget. Everyone! We're not here for photos! We're here to rescue the aliens! Rescue! Yeah, okay, it didn't work. Turns out a handful of gamers can't overthrow a government military base. Who knew? Shoot, maybe next time, I don't know. So what was the goal here? 1.5 million people signed up to storm Area 51 in 2019, but this wasn't the first time something like this happened. Back in the 1950s, the public also wanted answers. It was June 17th, 1959, and the Rizzo Evening Gazette published a story with the headline reading, More Flying Objects Seen in Clark Sky. That's pretty alarming. Then the paper went on to describe how Sergeant Wayne Anderson, a local sheriff, was one of many who spotted what the paper described as an object bright green in color and descending towards the earth at a speed too great to be an airplane. Yeah, I just watched Jordan Peele's No. Couldn't have done this list at a better time if you ask me. What did they see? It was green, it was close, was it Optimus Prime just coming to say what's up? I need answers, folks. And finally, number one, tombstones ashore. Here we go, death is calling. Back in 2012, the world thankfully did not end, but if you believed that it was going to, this this definitely would have freaked you out. Back in May 2012, two friends were on a nice beach walk right on the coast of San Francisco's Ocean Beach. Now, when all of a sudden, something that looked like a fridge started to crash through the waves and then onto the shore. Now, it turns out it was not a fridge. That would have been lovely. It would have been a nice surprise. Just some fridge goods popping out from 1976. It turns out it was a massive tombstone from the year 1876. It was a little more haunting than a fridge. The tomb originally belonged to Emma Bosworth, and then just one month later, another stone was found, this time with a different name. Of course, that'd be weird if it was the same name again. And then another one, and then another one. So what's going on here? The next tombstone belonged to Delia Presby Oliver from 1890. But the condition that they were in also, these tombstones, they looked brand new. You probably expect as I'm describing this that they're all old and broken apart. Nope. 
They're all pristine, even more haunting almost. I don't know. These tombstones came from the Laurel Hill Cemetery after it had shut its gates in 1940. So the headstones were then used as a makeshift seawall. If you ask me, that's a little rude. Your uncle's tombstone just covered in barnacles like he's Davy Jones? No thanks. Pop that out. Put that back. Draw that out. Kick it off the list at number 10, black cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly. You know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you. What's the first thing you think? Bad luck? Bad omen? bad stuff. Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory IX, he exposed a cult of witches in northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep. He knew some of the ritual words used at these cult meetings. He knew everything, which in my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now, at first, when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine, Flat Earth. Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the Earth isn't flat. That's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the Dark Ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat Earthers. Shocking enough, the Middle Ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the Earth as a sphere, with four cardinal points as well. Even going back further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link. And then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to, I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman law laundry days, urine makes leather soft, we get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help, they were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. Sorry, Big Chud. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just fine, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, Good game. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this, here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare, and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta, you know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards, you know what I mean? It's like a ritual, you gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor Place riot in New York City back in 1849, that was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? 
I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty, pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. But how many of those were actual witches? Like really, was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know, was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus. So she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good, the middle age greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 1561, which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. All right, number five, the Great Whiskey Fire. Now we talked about the molasses explosion. This is kind of similar, but also I can't believe it. I love when bartenders set your drink on fire like they're magicians, like, but the Great Whiskey Fire is nowhere close to an outstanding whiskey sour dressed up in a coop. In Dublin in 1875, 5,000 barrels of whiskey were ignited and made a river of fire in the streets of Dublin. The fire started at Malone's Malt House on Chamber Street where the barrels were being stored. Once the fire touched the barrels, obviously they exploded into a whiskey lava river of death. Unless you love a hot toddy, that is. I know a hot toddy is made with rum. I just, you know, you could, you could also use whiskey. Anyways. All you could basically do was run. It was like, it set fire to everything it touched. Water, sand, gravel were all useless against it, so Captain James Robert Ingram, the head of the fire brigade, suggested horse manure, and miraculously that worked, but imagine the smell. It was the most destructive fire in the history of Dublin, and 13 people died. As terrifying as this sounds, no one died from burns or suffocation from smoke inhalation. As the city was succumbing to the fire, crowds gathered around the pool of whiskey with pots, pans, hats, and boots to collect some for themselves. The people that did die, died because they got alcohol poisoning from drinking the contaminated whiskey from the street. I shouldn't laugh at that, I'm sorry. You can't make this stuff up. It's one of the reasons Irish and whiskey go hand in hand. I mean, what? Don't drink whiskey that's a lava street covered in horse manure. Don't do that. At number four, blue eyes. The 1986 Chernobyl disaster is one of, if not the worst, nuclear disaster in history. The explosion was caused by a flawed reactor that was being operated on by inexperienced workers. The initial disaster took the lives of 31 people and almost half a million people were evacuated from the area. So many lives were affected by the disaster and the intense nuclear radiation. The firefighters who battled the fires from the explosion were some of the most affected by the radiation and it's almost unbelievable what happened happened to their physical appearances because of the exposure. According to records, their skin started peeling off and their eyes turned bright blue. One of the Chernobyl firefighters who was affected by the nuclear radiation had his eyes go from dark brown to light blue. He was so heavily affected by the radiation that when he was buried, he was put into a coffin sealed with zinc to counteract the radiation. All right, this one's super cute and you might die, so get ready. Number three, Sergeant Stubby. I already know this movie is gonna make me cry. Dogs, man. If dogs are in movies, I'm done. We really don't deserve dogs, okay? We don't. Sergeant Stubby was actually a real heroic doggo. While training for combat in 1917, Private Robert Conroy found a little brindle puppy with a short tail. He named him Stubby, and little did he know that he would become a decorated war hero. Stubby became their mascot for the 26th Yankee Division, 102 infantry. He learned bugle calls, the drills, and even like a little docky salute. He would lift his right paw and just salute his head and was the only animal allowed at camp. Conroy snuck him aboard the SS Minnesota and the crew was won over by him obviously because he was so cute. 
How could you not? They brought him to the front lines and Stubby saved life after life. He woke soldiers during a gas attack, he rescued fallen soldiers on the battlefield by following the sound of English calls he could distinguish the languages, he even captured an enemy spy. After this incident, he was promoted to Sergeant Stubby. Because how can you not? He captured an enemy spy, he did his job. Sergeant Stubby served and survived 17 battles, staying with Conroy even until after the war. He finally passed away in 1926, his service complete. All right. At number two, Huberta the Hippo. You've probably never heard of Huberta the Hippo, South Africa's most famous hippo, so I'm going to tell you about her and what made her so extraordinary. In 1928, Huberta the Hippo walked 1,600 kilometers or 1,000 miles, traveling from her home in the St. Lucia estuary to East London. Huberta became quite the celebrity on her journey as she drew in large crowds of people wanting to see her and give her food. Along her journey, she even stopped at a country club, a theater, and even the beach. After failing to capture Huberta, she was officially declared royal game, meaning no one could harm her. Sadly, however, just a month after arriving in East London, she was shot by a couple of farmers. People were so upset that these farmers harmed Huberta that they demanded their arrest. The farmers were arrested and fined 25 pounds, which was a lot back then because it was the Great Depression. Huberta's body was given to a taxidermist in London, and in 1932, Huberta's body was sent back to South Africa, where thousands of people gathered to welcome her home. Number one, last but not least, Ching Shi. I love Pirates of the Caribbean. It's my jam. Pirate. Yeah. Before I knew how bad pirates would actually smell in real life, Jack Sparrow. Loved him, but really couldn't get like six feet next to him. He would have smelled so bad. But a movie series seriously needs to be made about Ching Shi. Her story is incredible. She became known as the terror of South China due to her massive fleet of over 50 to 70,000 pirates. She started out working as a woman of the night until one night she met Cheng Yi, the pirate captain who ruled over the red flag fleet. The captain proposed to her and she said yes under the condition that they would share the power of the fleet and the plunder. Together, they launched a fleet of over 1,800 ships. They were highly organized, ruthless, and disciplined. Sadly, six years into their marriage, her husband died, leaving Ching Shi alone to rule. She ran a tight ship, handing out fierce punishments to all those who disobeyed her orders. She was strict with her prisoners, keeping her men in check should any woman be taken in. Should they take a wife? Fine, but they had to remain faithful. If they didn't, well, dead. If they took a woman against her will, dead. Any who deserted would be hunted down and tortured, then killed. The Red Fleet eventually felt like a floating country, even routinely taxing villages. The Chinese government eventually realized they couldn't defeat her. They were so scared. So instead of um, going to battle, they made a bargain. A bargain that allowed her to retire to wherever she liked with all of her riches and her uh, new bow. So it's good to be a pirate queen. Number 10, the dust. In the year 536, apparently a large cloud of dust and or fog covered up the sun for 18 months in Europe. Naturally, back then, there could have been a thousand reasons why this could happen, or at least that's what people thought. A quote from the wise Procopius describes the event. <clears throat> as follows. For the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse, for the beams it shed were not clear, nor as it is accustomed to shed. And from the time when this thing happened to men, were free, neither from war, nor pestilence, nor any other thing leading to death. Ooh, wow, that sounds bad was bad. Our best guess is that there was a lot of volcanic activity at the time, and it could have covered parts of Europe, which is so awful, I can't even, and you'll see why. Number 9, Famine. So related to the last point, in a time in history where there's no industrial agricultural sector, greenhouses, and those grow lights that you're totally not growing the devil's lettuce with in your basement, yep, that's right, I know about it, mm -hmm, nice try, I know. Growing food can be difficult, weather, pests, disease, harvesting a full crop is both rewarding and difficult. Well, since the dust cloud had blocked out the sun for 18 months, that meant the crops were not reaching their full fruiting potential. This cloud of dust again most likely came from volcanic eruptions and is speculated to have even dropped the temperature a few degrees. God, that sounds awful. 
Number eight, the plague. Man, this is really shaping up to be the worst year ever. We thought 2020 was bad. Also in the year 536, there was a terrible plague known as the Justinian plague, or really it's the black plague, but it's first round of it. As if having the sky filled with smoke and no food wasn't worse enough, people were dropping left, right, and center. Literally, they couldn't keep up with the body count. Apparently reaching thousands within days. That's that's bad. You don't like that's not good. You don't want that. There were so many bodies that it began to stink up constantly. Constantinople. The bodies were thrown into the sea, but they kept resurfacing, which, uh, God, that's so gross. I oh, can't even be sick. So Emperor Justinian ordered the bodies removed from the city, which oftentimes led to the body carriers themselves succumbing to the disease. Too bad they're years away from some Purell and a mask. You know, just some little something to sanitize the hands with, you know? Jeez. Number seven, winter. Canada. Winter snow. For about seven to eight months out of the year in this country, it is cold, snowy, and cold weather. Right, Chris? Oh, yeah. Mind you, we do get nice summers here. It's just a little bit of a trade-off. So when it snows here, even in May, it's not that much of a surprise. However, when it does snow in places like Texas, we tend to take notice. This was the case in 536 China and in places in Mesopotamia, where during the summer months, there were reports of snow, which is really bad, especially if you're trying to grow food. I mean, there's no snow shovels, no plows, and no timmies. Canadians, how would we even function without a double-double on a cold, miserable morning? All Canuck jokes aside, it was quite devastating to the regions and just adds more to what really must be the worst year ever. Number six. Time to get oot. I am many things. Canadian, moderately funny, and a second-rate John Candy or Chris Farley. I love them both, but it depends where you're from. If you're Canadian, it's John Candy. If you're American, it's probably Chris Farley. What I'm not is, is a quitter. I'm a soldier, a fighter, a trooper, and I hustle my bustle, partner. I'm not shy to turn away from a challenge, and I strive to figure it out. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not afraid to throw in the towel. Sometimes you gotta know when to pull back, reassess, and most importantly, come back. If you, if you come back, you never really quit, did you? If you come Come back, you're good. Take for an example some towns in central and eastern Sweden during 536 who abandoned their towns. No one is really sure why, but uh, these towns were abandoned, <laughs> obviously. Not that it's easy to run a town, because trust me, I play city builders, I would know, but it's speculated that already cool temperatures could have been made worse by the volcanic ash that covered the sky. Ooh, yeah, you wouldn't want cold temperatures getting worse back then. Mm -mm. Bad for you. Number five, the Prohibition Era. The Prohibition Era was a time where there were restrictions placed on the consumption of alcohol, which of course was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, whatever portation, Asian, and sale of alcohol by the US government, all from 1920 to 1933. A real boring time. Not really. No one listened to it. Of course, this ban certainly didn't stop people from producing or consuming alcohol. It was just done in sneakier, unsafer ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead of, you know, normal drinkable stuff. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that's not widely known is something that the government agencies did to curb the black market sales. They poisoned the industrial alcohol on purpose that was being repurposed for drinking. So. Yeah, some villain stuff right there. Not just poison in a way where the consumer would get sick and maybe not want to drink it anymore, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this act alone. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials today. I mean, you know, cut to today, everything's legal now it seems, but... There was a time where it wasn't. Number four, not every state. Being a Canadian, at least, we're seeing things become legal all of a sudden, and that's weird. I'm 28 years old, and I'm like, what? This is legal now? Okay, that's weird. It's odd, but we saw this happen in Prohibition as well. Many governors at the time refused to throw away money towards enforcing or policing this alcohol ban. Maryland, for example. Okay, Maryland never even enacted the enforcement code in the first place, and eventually earned a reputation as the most stubborn anti-prohibition state in the union. Nice. New York followed and repealed its measures in 1923 and slowly but surely it all just went away. But some states did the opposite. They were all for the ban. Yeah, nerds. Kansas and Oklahoma remained dry until 1948 and 1958 and Mississippi remained alcohol free until 1966. That's like 33 years after the passage of the 21st amendment. Like. Guy, can we click refresh? Can we move on? I'm very thirsty, thank you. Number three, the Kensington system. All right, Queen Victoria, let's talk about you a little bit. Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of it before, it's pretty awful. Yeah, I thought I was grounded growing up. This is, whew. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created this Kensington system to control her daughter's life. I mean, she literally isolated this child from friends or family members, you name it. Her mother did this all to keep her 
pure. The system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every single action, including who she can see or even speak to. Victoria only had two friends growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Theodora of Leningen, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy. Oh, and the Duchess's attendant, Sir John Conroy, well, his daughter, Victoria. Two friends your entire life, that's awesome. I mean, I only had three friends growing up, but two, that's... That's just cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was queen. She literally couldn't walk down the hall to go to the washroom without her mother being by her side. Victoria has reflected on her childhood and she said that she hated John Conroy for manipulating her mother. She actually referred to him as demon incarnate. That's a... Uh... That's a hefty burn from Victoria. Number two, Al Capone's brother. What's going on with that guy during the Prohibition era? What's uh, what's the other side of the family doing this whole time? We don't hear about him. Siblings can be the exact same. My brother and I were the same person pretty much. Al Capone and his brother, they had to separate a little bit. They had to play different paths for a bit. Not homies for a bit, it seems. A little different. Al Capone's oldest brother was a prohibition enforcement agent. Yeah, how ironic is that? Al built a criminal empire built on illegal liquor in Chicago back in the 1920s, but Vincenzo, the eldest of the six Capone brothers, he had changed his name to Richard Joseph Hart, of course, to hide his identity, and after working for a bit in the circus, Vincenzo settled in Homer, Nebraska in 1922, and eventually he was a special officer assigned to investigate bootlegging. Now, after he lost his badge, on suspicion of theft, Vincendo reunited with the Capone family in 1940. He met back up with Al in Miami and started to get in on that family cash that he's been missing out on. And finally, number one, ice mask. Today you can go on Amazon and get a therapeutic gel face mask for like $20. If you're stressed out or trying to avoid puffy eyes, bam, throw this in the freezer for a hot minute and you're set, just like that. You can make your own aloe vera honey gel mask if you feel like. Just click any vlogger that says the word wellness in their bio and well, good luck. Back in the 40s, Hollywood makeup artist Max Factor Jr. created the first ever face mask to reduce facial puffiness. Yeah, what a magician. And it looked way cooler too. Again, pun intended. They didn't use freezer gels back then. Instead, just, well, a bunch of ice cube shaped containers that froze individually on your face. It was an ice cube tray mask, rather. It was actually invented to fight hangovers. That's one of the main reasons. How fun is that? Now, it's a shame that this design never got, you know, caught on because the ones today, they're no good. They're too cute. They're not cold enough or big enough. Imagine busting this mask out during a lecture. Imagine having this underneath the isolator. You could do anything you wanted. You can invent anything you wanted. I don't know, sound off below. Number 10, the first marathon. Now, the term marathon, right off the bat, it comes from ancient Greek history. The Battle of Marathon, I've certainly mentioned on this channel a few times. But let's look further a few hundred years, give or take. The first ever Olympics marathon. It was an absolute shit show. Seven miles from the finish line, one guy started ingesting strychnine and egg whites just so he could finish the race. So, yeah, that was the first ever modern use of narcotics in an official Olympic game sport. One dude was also running the marathon in dress shoes and dress pants. Just a classy lad with 58 blisters just booking for hours at a time. William Garcia, one of the 32 competitors, straight up almost died during this marathon. He collapsed mid-race. He barely made a recovery. Have you done a marathon before? If so, tell me your experience down below. I did the Toronto Marathon a month ago and I got 35 kilometers out of 42. It was so close it hurt my soul. If only I wasn't wearing those dress shoes, you know, maybe I would have finished. So close. Number nine, unsinkable Sam. In our last video, I asked who likes dogs and who likes cats and yada, yada, yada. This one here, I'll give to the cat people. You get one. Cats have nine lives. I'm a firm believer in this theory now. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tail began aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Yeah, also imagine that image right there. 2,200 soldiers just standing in a line and then also this black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard. Nobody knows how it got on, but I'm pretty sure one guy does. He's like, the Bismarck was decimated during one of the attacks, of course, and while the HMS Kozak was looking for survivors shortly after, they saw Oscar, the cat, on a plank. Yeah, he had to earn the unsinkable Sam alias, all right? You get a new life, you get a new name, then, then it happens. The HMS Kozak hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Kozak was destroyed. Now this time, it was the HMS Ark Royal who spotted the cat, and then the fearless feline was dubbed Unsinkable Sam. Little man passed away in 1955, not on a warship, so that's great. I hope there's therapy in cat heaven, my God. He's like, well, four out of the nine sucked. I don't know. Number eight, Robert Liston. In the early 19th century, crowds would gather to watch Dr. Robert Liston work, okay? They would huddle 
around like it was a dance battle. They get nice and close and breathe in each other's mouths. He was known as the fastest knife surgeon in the West. I know, how many red flags can you find already? A crowd, a fast surgery, this guy just in the middle of it. What's going on? Like, please help me. Please put me together. I don't know. This was a time before anesthesia had been developed, so you wanted things wrapped up quick. Pun intended. Now, Robert, he would have you amputated and sutured in three minutes flat, right? Don't you want that? Don't you want a nice fast surgery? Mortality rate was 300%. Not great at all, in fact. And then one fateful day, Robert attempted to beat any record previously held. He was trying to perform the fastest surgery, but during so, he accidentally cut off his assistant's fingers as well as the patient's leg. So, I don't know what the guy's doing with his arms, but you're like, buddy, slow down. We got more than three minutes, it seems. He also hit somebody else watching by accident. You know what I mean? Remember how I said crowds would gather, the old surgery crowd? This is why you don't stand too close, okay? It's like crump battles. You get too close, you're getting nicked by something. Either Robert or some guy in Tim's. Both are gonna hurt. I'm glad surgeons are taking their time now. I'm also glad no surgeons are trying new experiments at a record time. That's also nice. Can you take your time, please? Number seven, the first open heart surgery. Moving on to some other surgeons, a little better, hopefully. We've discussed ancient Egyptians and how they would clean the entire body out for the whole mummification process and then put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this, but when was the first open heart surgery? When did that happen? What did that room look like? The first successful open heart surgery went down in Chicago in 1893. It was honestly unbelievable. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. It was probably Robert Liston just doing his thing. Maybe he got too close, I don't know. And the surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale, Williams, who, by the way, used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man's life and he also made history. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add. So a lot of firsts happening in this one. Now there weren't any textbooks on this type of operation at the time, so the odds of survival, of course, were extremely low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all, right? No x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, no problem, right? Using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through all the nerves slowly, might I add, thankfully. He weaved through muscles, ribs, everything until eventually he closed a severed artery right near the heart. Cornish survived, thankfully, and come 1894, Williams was promoted to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Imagine he went back to being a shoemaker's assistant. He's like, all right, cool. Now I want those shoes. Number six, the Pfizer fine. When we think of the name Pfizer now, there's obviously mixed feelings, pun intended. But back in 2009, before they were making cures, they were paying some hefty fines. The world's largest pharmaceutical company had to pay a record-breaking fine. They had to pay $2.3 billion in criminal and civil penalties over unlawful prescription drug promotions. Now included in this mighty slap on the wrist was a $1.2 billion criminal fee. Now if that didn't sound bad enough, in the agreement was also a criminal forfeiture of $105 million. So you're paying and you're also getting more stuff taken away. It's all bad. This was the fourth time Pfizer got charged with this magnitude in a decade. They were on a pretty bad streak. What got them in hot water in the first place is that they would promote their products at resorts, right? They would invite doctors to these meetings, give them golf, massages, whatever. They'd pepper you up nice so that you were team Pfizer by the end of the trip. And you were all tanned. You look nice, right? FBI Assistant Director Kevin Perkins says the corporate giant was blatantly violating the law and misleading the public through false marketing claims. In our number five spot today, we have the London Burgers. This is the name used to refer to a notorious of body snatchers who operated in London in the early 19th century. They were involved in the illegal trade of selling corpses to medical schools for dissection and study, and they would often resort to killings to obtain the bodies. The most infamous member of the gang was William Burke, who, along with his partner William Hare, committed a series of killings in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1828. They sold the corpses to the anatomist Robert Knox, who was unaware of their methods. Two of the group's members, John Bishop and Thomas Williams were convicted of killings and sentenced to death. The London Burger scandal highlighted the demand for fresh corpses for medical research and contributed to the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which allowed for the legal procurement of corpses for medical purposes. Emphasis on the legal part of that, though. It's important. In our number four spot today, we have the Great Stink of London. The Great Stink of London was an environmental disaster that occurred in the summer of 1858. It was caused by the city's inadequate sewage system, which allowed raw sewage and waste to be dumped directly into the River Thames. The hot weather only exacerbated the problem, which is 
disgusting, and it caused the sewage to ferment and emit a foul odor that permeated the city. The smell was so overwhelming that it caused widespread illness and forced many people to flee the city. Parliament was forced to act, and a major engineering project was launched to build a modern sewage system for London. This project was led by engineer Joseph Bazalget, who designed a system of sewers and pumping stations that would carry sewage out of the city and into the Thames estuary. The construction of the new sewage system was a massive undertaking, involving the excavation of miles of tunnels and the construction of large pumping stations. It took several years to complete, but once it was finished, it greatly improved the health and hygiene of the city. The Great Stink was a turning point in the history of public health, and it helped to spur major improvements in sanitation and public health infrastructure across the developed world. Today, the legacy of the Great Stink lives on in the modern sewer systems and wastewater treatment facilities that are really essential for maintaining public health and environmental quality. In our number three spot today, we have Typhoid Mary. The Typhoid Mary case is a famous incident in the history of public health in the United States. Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary, was an asymptomatic carrier of the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, a potentially fatal disease. Despite being unaware of her condition, Mary inadvertently infected numerous people during her work as a cook in New York City in the early 1900s. After a number of typhoid outbreaks were traced back to Mary's cooking, she was tracked down and forcibly quarantined for several years. The case generated significant controversy at the time, with some arguing that Mary's civil rights had been violated and others maintaining that public safety justified her isolation. The typhoid Mary case remains significant for its implications for public health policy and for the balance between individual rights and public safety. In our number two spot today, we have the Birmingham riots. These riots took place in 1839, and they were a series of violent clashes that occurred in the city of Birmingham, England. The riots were sparked by tensions between two groups, the Chartists, who were calling for political reform and greater democratic representation, and the authorities who opposed the movement. On July 4th, 1839, a group of Chartists held a rally in Birmingham's Bull Ring, where they were met with opposition from local government agencies. The situation quickly escalated into violence, with protesters and authorities engaging in brutal clashes that lasted for several days. The Birmingham riots of 1839 were significant for their role in the history of the Chartist movement, and it is said that the events of 1839 demonstrated the lengths to which authorities were willing to go to suppress the movement. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Brown Dog Affair. This was a controversy that arose in the early 20th century in London over the use of animals in medical research. In 1903, a statue of a brown dog was erected in Battersea, which had been used in vivisection experiments by a scientist named William Bayless. If you're unfamiliar, vivisection is defined as, quote, the practice of performing operations on live animals for the purpose of experimentation or scientific research. While I am all for the advancement of science, I do believe in ethical studies, and this clearly was not that. The statue was intended as a memorial to the countless animals that had been used in medical research, but it was met with outrage from some people. Anti-vivisection groups saw it as a symbol of animal cruelty, while some medical researchers saw it as an attack on their work. In 1907, a group of medical students attacked the statue during a protest, sparking a violent confrontation with anti-vivisection activists. The statue was eventually removed by authorities, but the controversy continued to rage on for many years. The Brown Dog Affair highlighted the deep divisions in society over the use of animals in medical research and contributed to the development of new laws and regulations aimed at protecting animal welfare. At number 10, 18 month winter. If you live anywhere that gets harsh winters, then you know how annoying that it can be. Living in Canada, we know that all too well, and I can personally say that I despise winter. It basically lasts six months out of the year. If a six month winter sounds bad, then imagine how horrible an 18 month winter would be. In 1536 BCE, winter lasted a whole 18 months. Based on archaeological records, a thick dust veil and darkened skies caused temperatures to drop significantly in Europe and parts of Asia. This created some pretty frosty summers and harsh winters for those living in the area at the time. It is believed that this was all caused by a volcanic eruption that shot dust particles into the air and they didn't dissipate for a long time. This phenomenon wasn't just a minor inconvenience to people though, and it greatly impacted the lives of many. It is believed that about a third of Europe's population was wiped out and death rates soared to about 90% in northern regions. It was quite the catastrophe. Alright, number nine 
Dwayne Andrew Jackson. You know when you get so frustrated with someone, you just like take over and like do it yourself? You're like, come on, just, just let me do it. Well, that's probably exactly what went through Andrew Jackson's brain when he was about to be assassinated because it was so poorly done. He survived two point blank assassination attempts by the same guy, seconds apart. It was a cold, wet day in January in 1835, and Richard Lawrence waited behind a pillar inside the Capitol Rotunda. The aging president was there to attend a funeral, of all things, and Lawrence wanted to add one more body. He leapt from behind the pillar and fired. A loud bang went off, but the powder failed to ignite. Fail number one. Andrew was not pleased, and despite his aging form he was using a cane, he went at him with said cane. Lawrence quickly grabbed another pistol, and the same thing happened again. Misfire. Wow. You got so close dude and you really messed that up. During the trial it was confirmed that Lawrence was indeed insane and thought he was the true king of England. And according to him the only thing standing in his way to achieving like true power was Andrew Jackson. At number 8, Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami. Imagine a great wave of sticky syrup flooding your town. What would you do? Run? Hide? Have a quick snack? Well, for people in Boston in 1915, they didn't have enough time to think about those things when the Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami happened. On January 15, 1915, a 90-foot wide cast iron cask full of 2.5 million gallons of molasses suddenly exploded. The explosion caused a wall of molasses to shoot about 15 feet high at around 35 miles per hour. This sticky situation ended up destroying buildings, carried vehicles, and even drowned people and their horses. It is said that the Boston Toffee Apple tsunami killed about 21 people and injured 150. As people started to come into the hospital after the incident, witnesses recalled the victims looking like toffee apples, which is where the name for the event came from. It took the city weeks to clean up the molasses, but even for years following the incident, people said that they could still smell the molasses in the air on a hot day. Number 7, the big package. Okay, so technically this didn't happen. But it almost did. And the fact that it was even in the works, the fact that someone even thought of this and was like, yeah, that'll show the Russians. So ridiculous. No one really won the Cold War, but everyone has their perspective. But even today, the tensions between America and Russia are like pretty taut. Rather than all out trench warfare, the Cold War consisted of espionage and psychological warfare on both sides. The CIA had many plans, and one of them may surprise you. In the 1950s, Frank Wisner took over the OPC, the central part of the CIA. He sketched out the idea of how to really emasculate the Russians. Under his leadership, they drafted out a plan to drop massive condoms labeled medium to make them think that the US was superior to them, all based on the size of their John Thomases. Because when it comes to deciding whether or not to nuke another country, size matters. They would make the Russians bow to their superior sexual prowess of American men. Oh, sorry, I just almost knocked myself out with that eye roll. Whoa. Needless to say, the plan never came to fruition. At number 6, Rabbit Army. Weird question, but if you had to choose one animal to fight an army of, which animal would you choose? Well, whatever you choose, make sure it's not rabbits, because as fun as you think an army of rabbits might be, apparently they can be quite fearsome. In 1807, after signing the Treaties of Tilts, Napoleon wanted to celebrate a bit and he wanted to organize a rabbit hunt. He asked his chief of staff to organize the hunt and apparently he went way overboard with the bunnies. Instead of rounding up a couple dozen rabbits, this man said, oh, you want rabbits? All right, bet. And he got 3,000 rabbits. 3,000 rabbits! The rabbits were released into an open field for the hunt and people thought that they would just flee and run away. But instead, the rabbits ganged up on Napoleon and his crew and the bunnies charged at them. But don't worry, these bunnies didn't have a vengeance. They were just trying to make friends. You see, the chief of staff ended up getting tame farm rabbits and they were already used to humans, so they just wanted to say hi. But could you imagine those first few moments of having 3,000 rabbits chasing after you? Number five. Basket of bees. Guess what this one is? It's pretty much, that's exactly what it is. It's horrible. We often look at ancient Rome as the birthplace for numerals, modern plumbing, social life, all that good stuff. Don't get it twisted. Ancient Rome had a lot in common with the Dark Ages as well, okay? The punishments that they would inflict on others, horribly creative, I'll say that. 
Like for example, a basket of bees. A basket of bees, there we go. Maybe wasps, who knows, I don't know. History gets all crazy, you know? This punishment saw the victim placed in a large woven basket, naked, might I add. Then the basket was hoisted up near a beehive, of course, and then Romans would just anger the hive. They would just shake the basket. And then in turn, all these bees would sting said victim to death. This was meant to be a long and painful death, but eventually, this is how humans realized folks were allergic to bees because they would meet their demise a little too fast, you know? Romans would be like, ah, what happened? What's going on? Are we going home now? That's it? Number four, the Colosseum. They say Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Right? No, I'm asking you, I don't know. That's a saying, I think I've heard that somewhere. The word Colosseum is a Latin noun formed from the word Colossus, meaning gigantic. And it's huge. It once held more than 50,000 people at one time or another. That's literally the Yankee Stadium. This oval stadium was built from cement, limestone, and volcanic rock. Yeah, that thing ain't going anywhere. Historians and archaeologists are still discovering and unearthing secrets of this site. In fact, most of Rome still hasn't even been dug up yet. What? That's right. In fact, only about a tenth lays discovered, with the other 90% still somewhere around 30 feet below street level. Who knows how many wonders of the world lay unearthed. The Colosseum, also known as the seventh wonder of the world, lays megalithic, 615 feet above the ground at the center or heart of the city. It is the largest ancient amphitheater ever built, and it is still the largest standing amphitheater in the world today despite its age. Its use for the last thousand years were rampant with events, festivals, and would even flood its center to reenact naval wars with real ships. How did they get those things in there? I bet that's how they made the bottle and the ship thing, just kinda. And all that water? Just a guy with a giant hose? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, turn it on. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be here a while, guys. We gotta push the play. Number three, boot and rally. The Urban Dictionary added the old boot and rally back in 2002, but Romans, back in the ancient day, they were way ahead of us. Romans knew how to get down, and they also knew how to get it back up. Yeah, ancient Romans would boot and rally in order to continue eating and drinking. What would normally be a red flag at any house party or event was a sign of respect back then. These banquets, these were social events, okay? They were nothing like Tyler's toga party last Halloween. It's not, it's not the same at all. Same amount of puke, not the same theme. Attending these parties was a sign of social standing, so you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most, dance the most, converse the most, and... Also, yeah, puke the most. No playing around in Rome, okay? I wouldn't last two hours at one of these. Kyle knows what's up, he's seen it. I bring tums to the bar now, you know what I mean? I'm always prepared. The solution in ancient Rome was actually quite simple, long before tums. See, what you would do is, you would excuse yourself from dinner, <clears throat> go across the hall to the vomitorium, then you'd grab a feather, any feather you like, and then you would just go, and then put it back, and then go right back to dinner. Then enjoy more lobster, because, hey, now you made room. Number two. Gladiators. If you've seen the blockbuster hit Gladiator with Russell Crowe, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, then yeah, absolutely nailed it, because that's pretty well it. A stew of slaves, lawbreakers, and ex-soldiers, the Gladiator games were one of Rome's most brutal and vibrant live events. Gladiators would be held underground under the Colosseum until they would be called upon to spill the blood of both man and animal in sport. Fighters would be matched based on their size, previous record, skill level, style of fighting, and years of experience just like the professional contact sports today. Fighting out of the red corner at 195 pounds, the reigning victor, Spartacus! Oh, you're Spartacus? Oh, sorry. No, no, you're, you're, okay, you're Spartacus. Spar okay. But it wasn't all thumbs down for these fighters. Gladiators were the celebrities of their time. Yeah, you can take that, there you go. Ah, okay, one, we'll do one. Some gladiators even fought years after earning their freedom. Those years did not seem to be that long with the average lifespan of the gladiator, though living just to their mid-twenties. I mean, it was, it's pretty physical. The event was not just to kill your opponent. In fact, months of training and preparation was had. There was more of a spectacle of sportsmanship then, most of the time wounding their enemy, which would lead to the slow demise of a fighter, usually ranging between anywhere from eight to 10 fights in their whole career. Come on, dude. 50,000 people cheering you on at the Yankee Stadium? Kyle, Kyle, Kyle. Oh, no, 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 no. And finally, number one, fast food. Imagine getting a Happy Meal in 45 BC. You just get a toy of like Spartacus just 
Yeah, that's nice, I'll put it on the window. Romans were indulging in fast food before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 BC. They were having a good time until they weren't. Archaeologists recently excavated a thermopolium in the ruins of what was once thriving city of Pompeii. We found a snack bar in 2019 and it's since been reopened. Yeah, you can now pick up shifts once again at this restaurant. That was open thousands of years ago. As of last August, the restaurant, located at the intersection of Silver Wedding Street and Alley of Balconies, they would serve pork, snails, beef, fish, you name it. And the corner also doubled down and crushed fava beans, more often than not, mixing them with wine. So it was a good time, it was social. This was bumping on a Saturday night. The closest thing we have to ancient restaurants in Canada now is like, like coffee time. I don't know, every coffee time in Canada looks like it was damaged by Mount Vesuvius. Looks abandoned. The walls are broken in, nobody's working. I'm like, can I get a coffee? Hi, hello? Kicking off our list at number 10, John Lennon, or should I say, Jay Lennon. Here we go. This one comes from 1966. Now, if you're a Beatles fan or a fan of the Lord, you're in for a treat. Here we go. You definitely heard about this scandal, hopefully. During an interview with a UK newspaper, John Lennon started talking about the group and the band and how their popularity was on the rise. Normal band stuff, whatever, from John Lennon. But when Jay Lennon said the Beatles were more popular than Jay Christ, well, people got V upset. He didn't mean anything bad out of it, per se. He just noticed that the Christianity charts were on a decline around the world. Meanwhile, the Beatles are selling out left, right, and center. I get what he's trying to say, but yeah, he definitely messed up here. When a US newspaper printed this exchange months later, Christians were upset, more popular than Jesus. Look, I know what he's trying to say, but still, you can't say that, ever. Some radio stations actually stopped playing the band's music altogether. Christians gathered in bonfires to burn albums. Jay Lennon, not Jay Christ, but Jay Lennon, had to apologize numerous times at press conferences. He had to clear everything up just to Move on, get some peace, get some forgiveness from the Lord. Number nine, Natalie Wood's death. Natalie Woods was one of the most talented in Hollywood. The actress was in her early 20s and already she was getting Oscar nominations. She's known for West Side Story and Rebel Without a Cause, but when she was 43 years old, Natalie was sailing with her husband, Robert Wagner. They were sailing off Catalina Island in California and she lost her life. Now her death was considered an accident at the time. With very little details, it was classified as an accidental drowning. But come 2013, it was changed. It was changed to drowning and other undetermined factors. Wood, her husband Wagner, and Christopher Walken, yeah, who knew? They were all aboard the 60-foot yacht at the time, November 28th, 1981. The three actors had dinner in the harbor, then returned to the yacht to continue drinking and eating. Wood went missing around midnight, but the new information is that the couple had argued earlier that night. Now, this changes things, right? This changes the whole story. And according to a new report, that same report that was changed in 2013, after a different statement was released from the ship's captain, bruises and scratches that were considered fresh were seen on Wood's body. Woods was officially reported missing at 1.30 in the morning that night. So, a lot of questions, but I don't know. How do you solve that? This, how many years later? Number eight, the isolator. All right, a little different, but still definitely weird. This image may seem haunting at first, but it's actually quite ahead of its time. The isolator came long before noise canceling headphones or lo-fi beats to study and relax to. This goofy looking helmet was intended to block out noise and finally allow you to concentrate on finishing that Victorian era paper due the next day. Now this was back in the early to mid 1900s when inventor Hugh Gernsback worked hours and hours to create this study buddy to block out distractions in life. Now this is a powerful image because the things that distract us today like Instagram, Messenger, dating apps, YouTube, none of those things were even a concept back in 1925 when this device was revealed to the public. So you can only imagine what we need now, right? We need like the ultimate isolator. It's just a motorcycle helmet. It's just Daft Punk's helmet turned off, really. That's all we need. Number seven, Mary Pickford. Now, I mentioned earlier how these celebrity scandals often came from their love life, and then they have to, you know, maybe there's some stuff happening, maybe they were arguing before, that changes the game. Everyone cares about who's dating who and who's divorcing who. I mean, look how often we bring up Pete Davidson today. I mean, how's the guy doing it? Really, how's he doing it? Now, as hard as it is, we can't judge people off a headline or a scandal or whatever we see. We don't know the full story at all, regardless of what it looks like or what we want it to look like. The silent film star divorced her husband, Owen Moore, around the 1920s, and then she married a man named Douglas Fairbanks right after. Now, when I say right after, I mean less than a month right after. Like Pete Davidson speed. I'll admit that would interest me as well. I'd have my own opinion. Sure. Now, the public, at first, they weren't happy with Mary Pickford. They made assumptions about how long this affair had been going on. Oh, she was married. How could she? Yada, yada, yada. Her career was actually on the line because of the scandal, and that was until Owen Moore was confirmed to be a... Not so great guy. Turns out throughout their marriage, he was a 
towards Mary. So she went from being almost canceled with no job to the most courageous for telling her story, how the tides have turned. Number six, portable holding cell. Prisoner transport is always a risky game, right? I have YouTube, I see some stuff that goes on online, it's crazy. When out in public in any way, the odds that something goes wrong or they escape back into the real world and run away, it goes up significantly. The movie Con Air is about this exact situation unfolding. A timeless classic, Nicolas Cage, so good. Dave Chappelle's in that too, wild. Well, back in the 1920s, we didn't have SWAT teams move around the worst of the worst. Instead, we had bike cops with cages. It's pretty funny. This portable jail cell is an early version of our modern day police car. The concept was perfect, but the fact that this guy is sitting in a cell and could just grab the officer on the bicycle at any given moment, that's not so ideal. The fact that he's less than a foot away, that's not relaxing at all. Would you ever ride in one of these? I can barely do a sidecar in a motorcycle, let alone pegs on a bike. I don't know. If I'm not riding, I'm not on the bike ever. Number five. The sky is the limit. The 1920s witnessed remarkable advancements in aviation, right? As I just explained. Airplanes were becoming a widely accepted mode of transportation. But two significant milestones unfolded during this decade, shaping the course of aviation history. The first extraordinary achievement was by Charles Lindbergh, who embarked on a unprecedented solo flight way across the Atlantic Ocean. He flew from New York to Paris, May 1927. The historical feat captured the world's attention, showcasing the potential of aviation for long distance travel. Also, so, so terrifying to be the first person to fly over the ocean. I'd be like this the entire time. I'd be so, I couldn't breathe. I can't breathe right now, just talking about it. The following year, Amelia Earhart made her mark by becoming the first woman to traverse the same transatlantic route. Although she participated as a passenger, this sparked her entire life in history. So we'll say this is two in one. Number four, TV. How are you watching this? Are you watching it on your phone late at night? Should be sleeping, getting ready for work in the morning? Or are you watching it proudly on your TV? Also, should be going to sleep, but you're staying up watching YouTube. Nice. The first television invention dates back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, various inventors contributed to its development, took a few steps, that's for sure. But one notable pioneer was Philo Farnsworth. Great name also, Farnsworth, what a great, Great time. In 1927, Farnsworth successfully demonstrated the first fully functional electronic television system. And it was known back then as the image dissector. Yeah, are you watching this on your image dissector right now? Give us a thumbs up on your dissector. Thank you. His invention utilized a cathode ray tube to capture and transmit images through a series of electronic components. I have no idea how it works, but I love that it does. Big fan of that. Farnsworth's breakthrough led to the foundation for advancements in television technology, leading to the widespread adoption of TV as a form of modern entertainment. Again, big fan. I have like four TVs, man. This is ruining my life, really. Number three, radio. Video killed the radio star, but they had a really good run for a bit there. They had a couple of good years. In the year 1920, a significant milestone in communication occurred with the launch of the first commercial radio station in the United States, KDKA, based in Pittsburgh. Now, this event marked a transformative shift in how Americans access news and spent their leisure time. A lot of time listening to radio after that. They just sat down and just listened for a bit. The radio quickly gained popularity and by the end of the 1920s, approximately 12 million households had radios. A lot of distractions going on. The invention of radio broadcasting revolutionized how we took information, entertainment, and cultural content, connecting people across the land. And also, it was fun to listen to music. That's that's the most of what we do with that. Do you listen to the radio still? I feel like there's like two people that do. And they're, they're both my grandparents. That's about it. Number two, American football. The birth of American professional football can be traced back to August 1920, when the American professional football Football Association was established, eventually evolving into the renowned National Football League, the NFL, which we all, of course, know. The sport itself had originated as a variation of rugby, incorporating elements from the other type of football as well, and then they began gaining popularity in the 1880s. But by the 1910s, football had emerged as a spectator sport. It was bringing in audiences all across the United States. Now it was starting to get real. I have no idea how to play football. I have no idea how to watch football either. I just look at them like, cool, who's winning? What are they doing? Why aren't they playing? Who's talking? I don't know. They're just throwing things in while they're trying to play. I have no idea. I'm more of a water polo kind of guy. You know what I mean? And finally, number one, voting rights. Of course, of course. The journey towards women's voting rights in America was far too long. It culminated in the passing of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution in 1920, granting women the right to vote, finally. This achievement was the result of decades of activism, protest, and advocacy with the help of suffragettes Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The suffrage movement gained momentum in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as women fought for their political and social equality. The 19th Amendment marked a significant milestone in American history, of course. It expanded the democratic participation and it advanced 
gender equality. Cut to 100 years later, we're still working on it somehow. So hopefully we figure it out soon, right? Those are the top 10 unusual events from the Roaring Twenties. Do you believe we're in the Roaring Twenties again? Or are we in the Boring Twenties? I don't know. VR is making it, you know, a little interesting, but I think we're too far gone. Number 10, mummification. Back in the ancient Egyptian times, of course, mummification was common. And even today we're finding more mummies. It's pretty exciting. We're uncovering more ancient history every day. But how the hell was mummification done? Obviously we can't talk about this in school because we're a little too young and maybe it's a little frightening. So warning, it's a little gross. We've talked about teeth worms and trepidation, so I don't know, I feel like you're prepared. Well, for starters, mummification wasn't cheap. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. Now it's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you would put a hook in your nose and then you would pull out your, um, your brains. All of the brains and the mushy stuff just right out of your head. And then you'd cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all of those goods, all those organs, gone, easy. And then while those are drying, you would put the lungs and the liver in jars. So ancient Egyptians, that's why they needed a lot of jars. You gotta put lungs and organs in it. And then you put the heart back in the body and then wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that good stuff. And then you would cover the body in salt for 70 days. Now around day 40, you would stuff in some sand and then come day 70, that's when you would wrap them finally in the mummy bandages. And then the sarcophagus finally awaits. Those jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber. So if you watch the mummy and they're, you know, making somebody a mummy and they're like moving around, no, it wasn't like that at all. It took 70 days. It was a long, exhausting process. Number nine, first open heart surgery. Okay, going back to ancient Egyptians. Why not? We're on a little track here. So they would clean the entire body out and then they would put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this, obviously. But when was the first ever open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality after this? Well, the first successful open heart surgery after mummification went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a a brawl. The surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man. This is how he did it. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add, there weren't many textbooks on this type of operations at the time. So the odds of survival here were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all, being the first. At this point in time, there were no x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, and also no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through nerves, muscles, ribs, you name it, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Now, Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted, obviously, to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I didn't remember hearing those details in school. Probably would have fainted at my desk. Number eight, Bridget Bishop. Okay, getting some witchy nonsense for this one. Back in 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America and in results you would get covered in these sores, these pimple-like bubbles. It was really uncomfortable. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the people of Salem at first thought, oh, they're probably cursed. They're probably witches. Hence why they're acting odd. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of the disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, talking nonsense. Obviously they were extremely ill. And so the village doctor, William Greggs, just said, eh, I think they're bewitched. I think there's a couple of witches in our presence. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, you know, science, that's how it works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch and she was just cursing everybody around her. It was kind of the reason they kicked off the entire Salem witch hunt. It was all because of Bridget Bishop. Over the next few months, around 150 more folks were all convicted, all meeting their similar fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop or maybe it was just rye disease. It's now referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions. It feels like bugs are under your skin, it's horrible. But these doctors didn't know that back then. Everybody just thought they were all cursed, that they were witches. No, they were not cursed, they just needed help. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly stopped. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. I vote the latter, me personally. Number seven, Mail and Matt's daughter. Okay, sometimes in history, humans can be found guilty of practicing witchcraft. This is wild, this was like, 
Imagine, imagine that today. I've mentioned Giles Corey on this list before. He's a brave soul. But we also have to mention Malin, Matt's daughter. She doesn't get the light as much as Giles does. It's one thing for a town to turn against you and call you a witch, but imagine family. That's exactly what happened to Malin, Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody that she was a witch. She was the last victim of the great Swedish witch hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully the last, one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Yeah, she didn't cry out in pain. She didn't beg for forgiveness. She said all this witchy nonsense was hogwash and she stood by it too. What an OG, she was a champ, she was a badass. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so later she met a similar fate. You know what I'm saying? What goes around, comes around. Like a witch flying on a broom in circles. Number six, wedding season. Okay, we'll brighten the mood up a little bit. We'll start going this way in ancient history. Maybe you fantasized about your own big day, right? Maybe it's a beach wedding. Maybe it's a themed wedding, like a winter wonderland. Maybe it's a nice ice palace. It's always fun, I guess. I'm Canadian, so I'm like, no, definitely, but I hear you. It's your big day, okay? Get creative. They say the best month to get married is June. And again, from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must. See, June was the month of the god Juno. And they protect women and life when it comes to marriage and childbirth. So if it's between that and Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, right? Better omens over here, for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then. So when majority of the population washed up at the end of May or the beginning of June, everybody smelt nice, right? Everyone felt good and they wanted to celebrate. So why not have weddings in this month as well, right after we have a little bubble bath or two. That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. It does make sense. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Yeah, maternity leave? Never heard of it, sorry. Welcome to ancient history. It's the worst. Number five, Bridget Bishop. In 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and then in result, you would get covered in these sores, like pimple-like bubbles, it was horrible, it was really painful. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the fine people of Salem thought, no, they're probably witches. I think they're, I think they're witches who can float and do magic, for sure. That seems more realistic, right? Yeah, for sure. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of this disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, obviously being, you know, extremely ill. The village doctor, William Greggs, just said at this point that they were bewitched. He's like, uh, here's a word. And they're like, great, that did nothing. He's like, okay. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, well, that's how science works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch. The reason they kicked off this entire Salem witch hunt was Bridget Bishop and her sickness. So over the next few months, around 150 more were convicted, all meeting their similar horrible fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop, or maybe it was just Rye disease. Yeah, who would have thunk? Now it's referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions, everything's similar. It feels like there's bugs under your skin, which is the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. But these doctors didn't know that at the time. Everybody thought they were all just cursed, witches. They were not cursed, they just needed help. It's really just that. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly ended. Huh, weird. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they just run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter, it's probably the latter. Number four, steal. Don't steal, please. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody back in the medieval days, imagine proving that you're innocent, that you didn't just steal an apple and run it through a village, right? It's also really tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras. It was literally like Assassin's Creed. Just throw your hood up, grab an apple, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and hope for the best. Hope an arrow doesn't go on the way out. That's really it. The markup for stealing was also pretty wild for the time. It kind of had to be. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times that whatever you stole. So you better be a track star. You better have one of those pool vaults handy, my friend. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft. It wasn't all the same. So you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, depends. Again, I'm talking about a time where people believed in witches. People who made ducking stools. They made fun new methods for punishing one another. So, you know, who's to really say? But depending on where you got caught, you might lose a body part or you might just get a slap on the wrist. The reality is, more often than not, anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. Number three, coffins. Now when you hear the word coffin, odds are you're thinking of vampires or you know, some dude like this 
in a wooden box, uncomfortable. Coffins in the medieval times are a little bit different. They're outside the front of the castles, these cages, they're usually, you know, hanging off of some dainty, like, street light looking thing. Usually a crow is pecking away at a skeleton. It's haunting. Those cages are coffins. The victim was placed inside said cage, and the period of time they're kept there depends on your crime. Now, of course, people were left there to die a lot, but instead of sharp metal or a rusty chair, people would burn in the sun and then starve to death until animals or birds finished them off. But here's the kicker. Yeah, it gets worse, believe it or not. While these coffins would be placed in open, hot areas, a lot of the time, more often than not, they would be placed in public areas. So crowds would gather, they would talk, and then throw stuff at the victim while they were serving their time day after day. Even though you weren't sentenced to death, the town may just vote otherwise. Number two, animal witches. Okay, if you have any pets watching this video, get them out of the room. Cover their little fluffy ears for this. I don't want them getting any ideas. One of the craziest things about looking back to the Salem witch trials has to be that animals were also found guilty of witchcraft. Yeah, like a pig went to trial actual court. Grown adults would show up for animals. I'm dead serious. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. Yep, I wonder what house this pig would belong into. I vote Slytherin. No better sous chef than a golden retriever, in my humble opinion. But to be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so you know, it could have happened. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused, as well as two dogs. That's unbelievable. These villagers, their mindset was, if their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Why, of course, why else? What are they, hungry or thirsty? Pfft, no, they're for sure witches. Villagers believed witches traveled at night, not by broom per se, but by riding on the back of their pets. Yeah, it wasn't just dogs either. They thought that witches rode cows, pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. She would be so late to that cauldron cook-off. And finally, number one, Giles Corey. So after part one and now part two, we can safely conclude that the Salem witch trials were a bunch of bull Yeah, a bit of a, a bit of bogus, I'd say. Out of the 27 people who had their lives taken away from them during the 1692 trials, 19 were hanged, 17 passed away in prison while serving their sentence, you know, being a witch and all. But the very last victim, Giles Corey, he refused to plead either innocence or guilty, and the law at the time states that you can't be tried otherwise. So they had to try and punish it out of Giles. They had to try and get him to confess so that they could take his land. Yeah, they used brutal measures as well. They laid a heavy board on top of the 81-year-old Giles Corey, and then over the course of two days, boulders were slowly added, making the weight more and more unbearable. They were hoping at this point that Giles would admit something, but every time they asked him anything about being a witch, Giles responded with the same sentence. He just responded with, more weight. Yeah, keep him coming, he says. What a champ. After two days of this punishment, this excruciating pain, Corey did in fact pass away, still in full possession of his estate, which then went to his son-in-law. Now, if he had been found guilty, the government would have taken that from him. So he sadly did the best thing he could have long-term for his family at this point by not admitting. I mean, he had to deal with some of the dumbest and most cruel people that ever walked Salem. It's, it's pretty much just that, nothing to do with Giles or his choices. It's just, hey, check out how insane this town was. Yep, that's history. Number 10. Shin kicking. I mean, it's literally exactly what you think. You kick each other in the shins a lot, like over and over again. An early 17th century form of martial arts originating in England, obviously. This combat sport is a very simple one. Hold on to the opponent's collars to become close and then kick the absolute out of each other's shins. Athletes would stuff their trousers with hay for extra cushioning and specifically design their boots to be stronger and more rigid. First one to fall or give up loses. Dude, I woke up this morning and cranked my pinky toe off the door. I literally almost blacked out. I don't know how these guys did it. Alcohol was forbidden before the game as well, which was loosely regarded. Yeah, obviously, I'm about to snap my tibia and fibula off someone's Doc Martens. I'm slamming a couple Guinnesses before. Number nine, chariot racing. Look, I'm still a new driver. Left-hand turns, they freaked me out. I couldn't imagine chariot racing in any direction, even straight, no thank you. How do you even signal? Maybe, I don't know. Back in 700 BC, chariot races were like NASCAR. It was fast, it was loud, and it was dangerous. These events were held in arenas, like our modern forms of entertainment, and 10 chariots would race at the same time. It was chaos, it was a lot of dudes just flew out, it was nonsense. With tight turns and dust filling the air, it really was a spectacle. Horses were part of the Olympics come 684 BC, Four horse chariot races were being held in Olympia. You could have seen this. 
And then you watch the guy jogging and you're like, oh, I, I like that a bit more. It's a bit more loud. I like that one. The riders, they were brave souls, man. The ropes were often attached to the riders' wrists so that if they went overboard, they immediately, it was bad news for them. They were toast. Nobody's going out easy in the Coliseum, even when there's horses and nice things involved. Number eight, marathon running. We all know those runners who are up at five and get their miles. Who likes this stuff, man? Well, apparently the ancient Greek messenger Phidippides did. In fact, it was his job. Yeah, this guy would just like run place to place telling people stuff. The 42 kilometer foot race originating just shortly after the huge battle of Marathon. Ah, this is in fact where the sport gets its name from. Basically a bunch of guys showed up early and Buddy was like, yeah, you gotta run as fast as you possibly can from Marathon to Sparta and warn them. But that's like 42.195 kilometers away. Exactly! Remember, and run as fast as you can. No water belt, no gel packs, just panic and blisters. This Olympic sport needs no introduction. Just put some shoes on and go for a run yourself. Next time you're halfway through your warm up on the elliptical, just imagine the summer of 490 BC. Wouldn't it just been easier to just text them that they're coming? They are coming. Scene. Oh, okay, that was, that was real easy, thanks. Number seven, fisherman's joust. Not to be confused with fisherman's friend, although that's also quite as intense. Fisherman's jousting or water jousting was a combat sport originated in ancient Egypt. Yeah, it goes way back. They invented beauty and also water jousting. That's pretty amazing, we love it. Keeping it, keeping it balanced. Each vessel would have a few players, players, he says, and using one long pole per aquatic team, they have to poke and push the other players out of their vessel into the water. I'm pretty sure Kyle and I did this growing up with pool noodles. We'd ride inflatable alligators and just smack each other. We didn't even poke, it's like the loose noodle, right in the neck too is the worst. You dip it, good night, that's it, you're off that alligator. Now of course it wasn't a spectacle like it was in ancient Egyptian days, but also may have not have been a game, turns out. Yeah, historians are still scratching their heads over this ancient hieroglyphic that appears to depict water jousting. Was this a fun pastime or was this naval combat over fishing territory? For us, it was definitely the latter. It was for sure the latter. I was like, this is my pond, dude. Get out of here. Number six, pancreation. This vicious ancient Greek contest combines punching, kicking, and wrestling for an all out physical combat. A mix of martial arts. Dude, this is literally UFC. And the tail of the tape. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's fight! Big John McCarthy, of course, commentator on this fight tonight. Coming to you live from Las Vegas. This is literally UFC, people. You win by either knocking your opponent unconscious or by making them give up. Buddy, Patroclus has me in a flying armbar. I'm letting all of Greece down with that tap. Okay, okay! Much like modern day combat rules, there was no biting allowed or eye gouging. I can't stop thinking about not only the brutality of the fighters themselves, but the fans. Thousands of years of crowds showing up to chant and cheer on their favorite warrior. Just a spinning axe kick another right in the face. I love it. Number five, Agnes Sampson. And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, plague bearer. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the dark ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? We can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bearer is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. 
How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? If there's anything we learned in the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. Just a little bit, including misinformation. Ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages. Yeah, that title alone gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped the tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three in one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go. Keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale. There you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back, so. <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you'd leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers. Sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort. I can't believe this was a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare they? How dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this shit. There was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, shame for 46 minutes and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, did they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest at least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing as so many people did apparently back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals. They wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French coven, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing, like, in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please, stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. For most of these cases, most likely not witchcraft. This one here with the meowing nuns, I don't know. I think that was actually... Something was afoot, that was actually a curse. Either that or it's the greatest prank in history. Either way, we have to finish on a nice happier note, dare I say. Number 10, hotel speed. Okay, picture this. You're young and in a hotel with your parents. Maybe it's a vacation, maybe it's a trip, or maybe it's a hockey game, nice. Nonetheless, you find yourself in a long hallway with a strange looking carpet. Hotel hallways always have weird carpets, I don't know. Maybe it's the giant hamburger and milkshake you just ate. Maybe it's the hotel TV or the excitement of just not being at home. But something has changed. You're different. Your powers have been amplified. For this corridor will be your personal racetrack. A shame Guinness World Records isn't here to clock you in at max speed because for some reason if you fly down that hallway any faster, the rug would catch fire. Yes, the joys of running down a hotel hallway. This is probably how the first Olympians felt at the first Olympic Games. I'm comparing it to that for some reason, sure we'll go with it. Where the only event at these Olympic Games was running. Like many of the other events that would later come later on, this was done without clothing, which is fine. As long as you're, you know, not doing that in the hotel hallway. Keep clothes on. Number nine, WWE, brother. Only if you could have seen the look on my face when I discovered that wrestling in the WWE isn't as real as I thought it was. The shock, the confusion, and the loud ringing in my ear. It really, it was pretty serious for me. I got really into it as a kid. It gave me some Vietnam flashbacks, seriously. You mean to tell me that there was an intricate planning into every hit and fall, every entrance, and every time we heard the sound of a steel chair connecting with someone's forehead? Oh man, as a kid I never would have guessed that, but when The Undertaker walks in a room, you take notice, those thoughts just go away. Sadly, the ancient Greeks did not have cage matches, turnbuckles, or personas based on hyper male confidence. 
What they did have, however, was some real wrestling, some bare knuckle, no clothes, oiled up kind of wrestling. Nice. Instead of a one leg up pin, a scoring system was used for when the opponent's body was on the ground. And I'm sure lots of people got injured in the process. Whew, no thanks. I'll stick to the cage matches. Number 8. Pank Ration. Here's another story for you. It might seem kind of silly, but growing up, I got to witness the birth of a mainstream sport. The UFC got its start in the early 90s, but blew up in the mid 2000s. Now, I'm not much of a sports guy. Besides major championship matches or games, I don't really watch any sports. I'm more of a film and video game guy, if you couldn't tell. However, my first interaction with the UFC was seeing an octagon shaped ring, and my grade 2 geometry immediately kicked in and said, that, that's an octagon. Wow, okay, that's different. However, the second thing that I noticed is that this was not wrestling, and this wasn't boxing. It was kind of a mixture of both. Sort of a mixed martial art, if you will. Well, that's kind of what Pank Ration was. There was no indirect punching or kicking, but pretty much anything else goes. To me, this sounds like a good way to get injured. Kind of like wrestling before, now it's just even worse. And as I'm sure you all know, paper cuts can be lethal back then, so maybe not such a good idea. Did I mention this is done without clothes too? There's, everyone's, everyone's naked. Number 7. The Road Trip This isn't an Olympic event, but honestly, it should have been. Think about it for a minute. I want you guys to look out the nearest window right now. Get up, go ahead, look out the nearest window. Tell me what you see. You probably see a road with cars. When you need a fast food fix, it's as simple as getting in a car and driving on the road to your destination. Or getting it delivered with your favorite food delivery app. It's 2022, we can do a lot of crazy stuff now. What I'm getting at is that people from all over the Greek city states came to Olympia to witness the first Olympics. Except, you know, it would have been a triathlon just to get there. Frankly, my biggest fear, walking. That was the main mode of transportation, which after a while in those sandals was probably hell. Imagine trekking many, many miles by land and sea to only be exhausted to watch athletes become exhausted. Oh, I need some water just thinking about it. Woo. Number six, peace. Peace. What's better than a good war? A better armistice, or at least I'd like to hope so. During these first Olympic Games, which on a side note, if I had a time machine and a scooter, I'd love to see firsthand. There was people and athletes coming from all corners of Hellenistic civilization, all Greek states and colonies. Well, sometimes these Greek states got caught up in these little things called wars. Who knew, right? But when the Olympics were on, a truce was called. Messengers were dispatched to announce the truce, which gave all the people traveling on their long treks safe passage. I also find it somewhat amusing that they did this all for one day. That's right, the events only lasted one day. Some folks did days of traveling only to have it all be over in 24 hours. The opening ceremony couldn't have taken that long either, so. I feel like it's kind of a waste of time. Only if we got some of that peace right now. Russia is looking at Ukraine a certain kind of way, just, just waiting to act up. Bad Russia, stay in your corner. Number five, hysteria. Okay, so what's the first thing people are gonna do when the skies turn to ash and crops perish and it's cold? Well, what will we do? Band together and fight through the elements as humans because we are stronger together? Ah, big prank! No, we panicked and had mass hysteria. And it was our fault and God was punishing us for our sins. Or at least one story from Egypt, that's how the story goes. Sure, I guess this is all bad luck and it would seem like divine intervention to people back then. Especially with the sky being so dark for so long. That's it does seem like something a god would do. And if you think we still don't do that, well, wind the clock back two years ago, my friends. Remember when toilet paper was running low? That, my friends, is textbook hysteria. But then again, you know, having a dark cloud in the sky is all right, but there'd be a lot of dark clouds in your pants, you know what I'm saying? You miss you got toilet paper, you know what I'm saying? Number four, more volcanoes. What's worse than having a volcano cause all these issues? More volcano eruptions, yeah, let's go! Yeah, again, no one is sure if there was a specific one that was causing all the issues, but evidence in Iceland suggests that there were at least two volcanic eruptions. There's other evidence that suggests it could have been all the way in El Salvador and even North America. A lot of folks just don't realize how catastrophic volcanoes can be, but if you ask somebody in Pompeii, they would tell you. These extra eruptions plunged the earth into what is sometimes called the Tiny Ice Age, as temperatures severely dropped. Well, a couple, a couple degrees can make a big difference. It sounds bad, but a couple degrees can. All I'm gonna say is that comedy comes in threes. I'm surprised there wasn't a third eruption. Why is the ground shaking? 
Number three, Romulus Fallus. 536, this awful no good, very bad year, likely sealed the fate of the Roman Empire. For a while, she had been in decline, and her capital had already moved east. But like a lot of washed up sober music stars of the 80s, it was time for one more tour. One last hurrah to capture glory in a bottle. Well, go ahead and look at the map of Europe right now. I'll give you a second, go ahead, sure, look at it. You see that? Yeah, there's no Roman Empire, is there? No. That's because the year 536 was full of disease, war, and uprisings. Pesky uprisings. Ugh, those are the worst. How, how's, a, how's a dictator supposed to rule without those? Come on. In the year 541, an estimated 30% of the Byzantine Empire had perished from the plague. That's not good. You gotta have the population there. That's bad. Number two, Mosh trouble. The Mosh were a civilization in what is now Peru. That's right, there were troubles back there too. It's not all just Europe. They were extremely dominant of that area, masters of irrigation and fishermen. They made their food stockpiles big, and they were a force to be reckoned with. Had a pretty decent economy too. Well, due to some weather changes in the area, the water temperature rose. Ooh, too much. The fish that the most relied on for food and economy were now gone. And when you're a single industry empire and that industry goes away, well, well, it's gonna hurt. This led to massive starvation in the Mosh. Funny enough, all this climate change in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, I know we're jumping all over the place here, but it was good. The climate was okay. They saw more rainfall allowing for better crops, which allowed them to, to bring more camels. More camels means more soldiers. More soldiers means more conquering. It's crazy how it works like that. So I guess it just depends where you live. Number one, economy and survival. All of this makes you wonder how we survived this. I honestly, I'm not sure. Truth be told, it was a matter of just letting it run its course. Sometimes that's the best. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here to talk about it today. Something I find interesting, however, was during all of this, Emperor Justinian tried to raise taxes to aid in the economic downfall they were feeling. Hey, nobody likes taxes being raised. Unless the government was gonna make a public beer fountain. I feel like we'd all like that. I feel like everybody would be okay with that. Yeah, I, I think so. Between the fog, the plague, the starvation, and the higher taxes that kind of ruined everything, well, I mean, I guess we have roads now, right? That's kind of cool. Roads are pretty sweet, right? I guess so. I don't know. Just a bad time. Stay at a 536. Time travelers, stay at a, stay at a 536. You don't want to go there. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Tichborne case. This was quite a bizarre legal case that captivated Victorian England in the 1860s and 1870s. It involved a claimant named Arthur Orton, who alleged that he was the long lost heir to the Tichborne baronetcy. Despite numerous inconsistencies in his story, Arthur managed to convince some members of the Tichborne family and a significant portion of the public that he was who he claimed to be. The case went to trial in 1873 and it became a media sensation with thousands of people lining up outside the courthouse to catch a glimpse of the proceedings. This was basically like the Victorian era's OJ trial or the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, you know? The people wanted to know. Despite Arthur's conviction for perjury, the case continued to fascinate the public for years to come and it became a symbol of the era's fascination with sensationalism and fraud. The Tichborne case remains one of the most infamous legal cases in British history and is a cautionary tale about the dangers of believing in something without sufficient evidence. In our number 9 spot today, we have the London Beer Flood. This sounds like it would be quite a fun time, but it was anything but that and instead was a tragic event that occurred on October 17th, 1814 in the St. Giles District of London. At the Mew and Company Brewery, a massive vat containing over 135,000 gallons of beer suddenly ruptured, causing a wave of beer to flood the surrounding streets. The torrent of beer destroyed several nearby houses, killing eight people and injuring many others. The flood was so powerful that it even knocked down the wall of a nearby pub, trapping and killing some of the patrons inside. The London beer flood was caused by a combination of factors, including poor construction of the vat and overfilling it with beer. The brewery had a history of safety concerns Concerns, and many of the workers were aware of the dangers associated with working there. Despite this, the brewery continued to operate and tragedy struck. The incident became the subject of much media attention at the time and it continues to be remembered today as a tragic and bizarre event in London's history. The victims of the flood were commemorated with a plaque on the site of the former brewery and the incident has been the subject of numerous articles, books, 
and even a stage play. Not sure the logistics of that one though. In our number eight spot today, we have the Victorian bicycle craze. This is a name to refer to a period of intense enthusiasm for bicycles that swept across Europe and North America in the late 19th century. The introduction of the safety bicycle with its chain driven mechanism and rubber tires made cycling a much more accessible activity for the general public. It became a popular mode of transportation and leisure activity, particularly among the middle and upper classes. The craze also had a significant impact on fashion with women's clothing becoming more practical and comfortable to allow for cycling. It's funny to think of now because like it's just a bike, but at the time it was so much more than that. It's like how smartphones completely changed our lives in more ways than we probably even know. That's basically what the bike was like in the Victorian era. The bicycle craze had a profound impact on society and culture at the time. It led to the development of new industries such as cycling clubs, and it also paved the way for the modern transportation industry. The bicycle became a symbol of freedom and empowerment, particularly for women who were able to travel further and faster than ever before. The Victorian bicycle craze remains an important cultural and historical phenomenon that changed the way people lived, worked, and played. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Crimean War. The Crimean War was a conflict fought between 1853 and 1856, primarily involving Russia and an alliance of France, Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia. The war was fought over various territorial and religious disputes, particularly regarding the rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. The war was marked by high casualties, particularly from disease and poor medical care, and it is often seen as a turning point in military medicine. The war also featured some of the first extensive use of modern technologies such as telegraphs and railways which greatly impacted warfare in the future. The war ended in a victory for the allied forces and it resulted in a significant shakeup of the balance of power in Europe. It also demonstrated the need for improved communication, organization, and medical care in military conflicts and it had significant long-term impacts on military and political strategies in Europe and beyond. In our number 6 spot today we have the East End Outbreak. The East End Outbreak was an outbreak of cholera in 1866 and was a major epidemic that struck the densely populated area of East London, causing widespread illness and death. Cholera is a highly contagious disease that spreads through contaminated water, and in the Victorian era, London's water supply was notoriously unsanitary. The outbreak was particularly devastating in the East End, where poverty and overcrowding made residents more vulnerable to disease. The outbreak led to significant changes in public health policy and infrastructure, as well as increased public awareness of the importance of sanitation and hygiene. The physician Jon Snow, which you know feels like a weird name to say when I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, but the physician Jon Snow played a key role in identifying the source of the outbreak, tracing it to a contaminated water pump on Broad Street. His work really paved the way for the development of modern epidemiology and disease prevention. The the East End cholera outbreak remains a significant event in the history of public health and the struggle for social justice. It brought attention to the urgent need for clean water and adequate sanitation, and it helped to spur reforms that improved the health and well-being of people in urban areas. Number 5. Best Man Origins I got asked to be a best man recently, so you know what? I have to share some, some, some love. I have to share some ancient best man love. It was a little different back then, that's for sure. Back in those days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, that's normal, whether that's a brother or a best friend. Back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different, and it was all about protecting one's assets rather than, you know, anything to do with love. Back then, bride kidnapping was so common that if there was somebody else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to send someone else, they might try and steal her for themselves, right? It's awful. That's where the best man comes in. He's got a watch for dudes hopping fences ready to steal your wife and run away. The best man's job was to protect the bride at all costs, and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter, that's wild. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure she didn't try and make a run for it as well. It sounds okay at first, and then you're like, oh no, it's all horrible. History. Course. Number four, ancient divorce. Eh, it happens sometimes. Weird. Almost like those marriages I just uh, explained wouldn't work out all the time. Weird. Trial by combat. You've probably heard of this, right? We've all seen that Game of Thrones episode. The eyes and the... Huh. 
Yeah, that's a good one. That was the norm, right? You fight for your freedom. But what about divorce by combat? You ever heard of this? If you and your significant other weren't getting along back in the dark ages, instead of dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork, instead, you would battle each other in front of a crowd because why not? It's the medieval times. It was an organized event that included restrictions for the husband. Now, it's pretty hilarious to think back on, but the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back, while the wife, soon to be happy ex-wife, ran around in circles around said hole, also carrying a sack full of rocks, hitting the ex-husband with the rocks the whole time. Yeah, Pretty intense and also pretty hilarious to think of. Yeah, that's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot. Get out of here. A sack of rocks? Just take the castle, take the horse. I don't care, I'm out. I'll sign anything. I'll stamp anything. Number three, the battle of the stray dog. Okay, now we're gonna go back into some weird battles that we probably missed in school. I grew up with dogs my whole life, okay? It's stressful at times. You open the door for a second and all of a sudden your furry friends are running down the street after a blue jay and your heart's racing. Since the second Balkan war in the early 1900s, Greece and Bulgaria were going head to head, right? At this point, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of emotions, tensions were of course high. But come October 1925, things finally escalated even more. A Greek soldier was chasing after his dog, who just decided to bolt randomly. But in doing so, he accidentally crossed the border into Bulgaria. So he was shot at, right? It was scary. The Greeks at that point were beyond upset, so they marched into Bulgaria and soon began a full-on war. All because of this dog who saw a blue jay probably. By the time the international committee negotiated a ceasefire to clear up the obvious misunderstanding, 50 people had already lost their lives. So yeah, keep those leashes on, please, unless you're in a off-leash dog park. Cause you might start a war, you never know. Number two, the battle of Los Angeles. Of course I have to mention this battle. This one's a little bit different, but you know, maybe some UFO stuff going on here. The battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great LA Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February, 1942. This event, first of all, it took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So yeah, everybody was of course immensely stressed out at this point. And then something like 25 enemy aircraft was then spotted flying over LA in the late hours of February 24th. So now everyone's freaking out. Air raids went off, blackouts were in effect. This was not a drill, right? Right? Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells, in total around 1400 shells were all fired off. Two people had heart attacks. Five people died in total from this retaliation and it was all a false alarm. Yep. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Yeah, huh, oops. Thought I heard a noise, my bad, we'll just close that. No one touches anymore, I guess. War nerves. And finally, number one, Battle of Zappolino. This one is pretty epic, okay. All over a bucket. Turning the calendars back to 1325, the Battle of Zappolino, it was a large scale event all over a tiny bucket. And no, I'm not joking. The War of the Oaken Bucket. Now this war consisted of two Italian towns, Bologna and Medina. Now it all kicked off when soldiers from Medina snuck into Bologna with intentions to steal. To steal the wooden bucket from the city's well. Right? Resources were sparse back then, of course, so the Bolognese declared war, and then they sent in an invading force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavaliers. The city of Modena had a smaller army. They had 500 infantrymen and only 2,000 cavalry forces. But the thing is, those guys still won. They chased the larger army back to Bologna while destroying towns in the process. Now, some recall them bringing the bucket back just to taunt the city, but right now, the bucket is currently on display still in Modena, so it ended up finding its forever home there. And you can go check it out if you want. That many people kicked the bucket over this bucket. History is strange, my friend. Number 10, Desimviri, the law of 12 tables. Well, actually, the word means 10. 10 men, actually. Those special 10 would be the appointed men who would consider themselves the first ever lawmakers. The earliest attempts to create a code of law was the Law of 12 Tables. A commission of 10 men, or also known as the Decemviri, was appointed 455 BC to draw up a code of law binding rules on both patrician and plebeian, which would be strictly enforced. Some of these laws included simple laws like, you don't break your word. If the army or king calls on you, you gotta go. And of course, if you hit or hurt someone, you get hit or hurt back. And you owe us some money. This system was the first in its place holding people responsible for the things that they did and said in Rome. Strategic, fundamental, and important laws like, hey, 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 no crying at funerals, all right? You burn my corn, I'm gonna burn your corn, and I get to burn you. And yeah, no meetings at night. It, it's dark. Okay, so they missed their mark on a couple of them, but a couple of those laws still stuck around. Number nine, field surgery. 
The Romans were fierce on the battlefield, but they were also extremely handy. Who would have thought? This was the first time in history where quick surgeries were performed on the battlefield under the leadership of Augustus. Not Augustus Mayhew, it's a different Augustus, but he's also really helpful, like one time a year. Ancient Roman medics invented hemostatic tourniquets and surgical clamps. Yeah, guy invented clamps. Imagine that on a resume. Roman field doctors would also perform physicals on new warriors. Yeah, they would also combat the spread of disease. Although they were going to war and were constantly being patched up, the Roman military would often live longer than the average folk because these military men were constantly being disinfected. They were checking their camps all day. Masks are hard in 2020, but the Romans were disinfecting the Colosseum. Nice, we'll get there one day. Maybe, maybe. Number eight, the name Rome. We kind of got into this a little bit about those brothers Ramus and Romulus. This barbaric history is loose and from many sources, so I'm gonna kind of sum it up into broad statements. Two brothers didn't like each other, kept fighting, raised by a wolf and a bird. That's pretty much it. We have seen what these two have looked like. Every statue and painting of these two is always like one of them stone cold Steve Austin the other one. One built a wall and the other mocked him and jumped over that wall and then there is only one. I feel like I made a sandcastle once and Taylor stepped on it and I can absolutely see how the city was formed. Flawless victory. Yeah, that sounds like brotherly love to me. Rome deriving from its name Romulus, the victor in this legendary sibling quarrel, giving the city its official name. Hey, you got the god of war as your dad, and the mother of all gods and goddesses as your mom, there's gonna be some feeling of purpose just lingering around. Guess I could just like make a wall. And with a couple drywall holes later, with the death and defeat of his brother Ramus, Romulus claimed his position as king and named the city after himself. Selfish much. Ugh, he ain't heavy, baby. He's my brother. Number seven. Daily Acts. In a time before Twitter or Facebook, how else do we get our fake news, right? How do we share our ants' nonsense? How do we do it? 131 BC, this marked the first time a newspaper was ever used. Well, they're referred to as Daily Acts at this point, or Acta Diurna. The saying, written in stone, couldn't have been more historically accurate in this case. See these texts containing information on military or civil issues, death notices, gladiatorial events, you name it. These were commonly written on metal or stone. Your morning news etched into a stone. Imagine the crossword section in 131 BC. Hey honey, who's the neighbor in Simpsons? Flanders, nice, that's it. Ping, ping, is that an F? <sighs> ping. It took time and effort, it was exhausting just to get one notice out to the public. So you best take these notes seriously, okay? Imagine YouTube comments written in stone. It took a guy six business days to write it, so he meant it. Number six, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a Roman general and statesman, a member of the first triumvirate. Caesar led the Roman armies in the Gallic Wars, which, well, we've seen and heard about these battles that Julius Caesar led. It's the organized outfit of shiny metal and red moving slowly and swiftly through the Gauls like a man-made tank before defeating his political rival, Pompey the Great, another military leader, and also the husband of Caesar's daughter, Julia. Okay, there it is, yeah. That's why he became his nemesis, political differences, yeah. Due to these ongoing internal civil wars between the two leaders, Julius Caesar eventually killed Pompey in battle and became dictator of Rome. This was until his assassination in 44 BC. Oh. Mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Eh, fare thee well. Antony, Act 3, Scene 1. Hey man, eye for an eye. You read the rules. He played a crucial role in the events that led to the Roman Empire and remains one of the brightest and bravest military leaders the world has ever seen. His story can be seen and heard top to tail in William Shakespeare's play simply titled Julius Caesar. Number 5, Gymnastics. Imagine being the first guy to ever do a backflip. Imagine being the first guy to ever see a backflip. I think that's more of a spectacle, if anything. Gymnastics were developed around 500 BCE. Ancient Greeks loved parkour, apparently. Who would have thunk? Once the Romans invaded Greece, the Roman army made it a point to study gymnastics. They needed their soldiers to be quick, light, versatile, and flexible. Anything that makes them more terrifying, really, that's the better. Those moves were so dazzling that the Olympics had to include gymnastics as a sport. But once the games were outlawed in 939 AD, the gymnastics game almost, almost came to an end. Once the 1800s rolled around, we saw the return of tuck jumps and straddle sits. 
Thank God. We almost lost it. We were so, we were so close. German doctors Johann Friedrich Gutsmith and Friedrich Ludwig Jahn, they changed the athletic game forever when they created these new exercise routines for young men, including the pummel horse, balance beam, vaulting horse, horizontal bar, you name it, those things that we do when we work, you know, when we work out every day. Chris is like, yep, I do all those every morning. These doctors wanted to see some flips. They got flips, my friend. Number four, boxing. Straightforward and simple. This ancient sport is depicted from hieroglyphics in tombs of Egypt all the way to the wall carvings of ancient Sumer. One of the oldest sports events known to man, boxing has made a place to stay in history for the last 5,000 years. The Greeks made this form of brutality into a spectacle by wrapping their hands with leather straps lined with metal to either knock their opponents unconscious or even death. Oh, oh okay, you wrap that under. Okay, how do you play ref? Oh, you just punch each other right in the face until there's just one of us. Got it. Weighing in at 145 pounds with a reach across of 71 inches in the blue trunks, Patroclus Angelopoulos. No mouth guards, no rounds, just punchy punchy and sleepy sleepy. I don't know why I'm still doing this voice. I don't know. <laughs> Number three, Viking hockey. Being a Canadian and all, this one, oh, this one hit, this one hurt. Buckle up lads, turns out Canadians did not invent hockey. Yeah, we found out during Canada's 150th celebration of all times. We're like, what? Yeah, we found out hockey wasn't so Canadian after all. It was Vikings, who knew? They actually brought it here in the first place. They also didn't call it hockey either. They called it a way better name. Slap Fatten. Go slap some fat around with the boys. Oh yeah, me and the boys are gonna grab some Timmies and go play some road Slap Fatten. Yeah, it's, instead of yelling car, they just yell R, and then they keep playing. They're like, no, turn around, go back. Slap some fat in your car. Vikings would gather sticks and of course some fat and then they would slap them in between two posts. They would just make two posts. Here or here, it doesn't matter. They'd make the rules up. Imagine getting cross-checked by a Viking. See you later, chest plate. Non-existent anymore. Offside. Number two, long jump. The long jump, originating in 656 Greece, was an Olympic sport consisting of simply hurling your body over a vast distance of horizontal space. Usually these spaces would include streams, bogs, or ravines. This ancient sport differs from the modern long jump, of course, just a tad. And of course, long jump wouldn't be long jump without the flute music. That's right, this sport was always accompanied by a flutist since music was a very important part of the spectacle of the ancient Olympic games. Hey man, can you play Jump by Van Halen? Just kind of gets... No? Okay, you don't know that one? No worries. Back then the Olympians would hold weights in both of their hands, either one, two, or five kilogram carved stones. Almost like kettlebells to help them swing momentum after their initial run up. I love that the times are either something really safe and fun like swimming or jumping, and then you're like standing next to an athlete during the anthem whose job it is to literally break people. Uh, yeah, I'm a jumper. Oh, you're a fighter. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I jump. So. Nice man. Break a leg out there. No, 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 it's not what I meant. And finally, number one, no rules football. Personal favorite, always gotta bring this one up. This is so scary. I've never played a game of rugby. I don't even know, I don't want any part of this. Sport fans are a bit much. I'll start by saying that. The whole yelling at the TV thing, unless I'm seeing the Green Goblin, I'm not yelling at any TV screen ever, period. But sportsmanship goes back, way back. Football was also a lot different in the late 12th century. See, instead of quarter kicks and throw-ins, you could do anything you wanted to retrieve said ball from the opposing team. Anything, like, you know, what we were mentioning earlier, you can just do that and just knock someone out and take their stuff. Also, there's no limit to how many players you had on your side. You can grab thousands, hundreds, whatever, you name it. It would be town versus town. It was hilarious. They called this a sport. But finally, come 1314, King Edward II banned the game. Obviously, people were dying for no reason. The only time diving was allowed was back in this game. I can, that's acceptable. When you would get kicked in the neck by a knight on a horse, more than fair. I'd say stay down if I were you, for sure. I would act, I'd be like, oh, my neck, what? See ya. Two minutes in, I'm out of the game. I can't even play football today, let alone football in the dark ages. What a joke. My back already hurts from this. Number 10, President Edith Wilson. In the year 1919, President Woodrow Wilson experienced a severe stroke that greatly impacted his abilities. However, instead of publicly disclosing this information, this very personal information, the government chose to maintain secrecy, believing that it was in the best interest of the nation. Now, what happened next was pretty amazing. The public remained unaware of Wilson's stroke for several months, but during this time, Edith Wilson took on a significant role in making executive decisions on his behalf. So in retrospect, historically, 
historians now acknowledge that Mrs. Wilson effectively assumed the role of one U.S. president for the remainder of Wilson's term. This remarkable circumstance highlights the fact that a woman, Edith Wilson, effectively held the reins of the country's leadership through the year 1920, which is amazing. We don't talk about that nearly enough. Number nine, stay thirsty. On January 16th, 1920, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States came into effect, initiating the era known as the Prohibition. This was a sad one. This was a pretty... Pretty lousy one right here. This amendment outlawed the sale of booze, leading to the closure of taverns, bars, saloons, every fun place that you can meet people and have a good time, all shut down, as well as the removal of liquor from store shelves. However, despite the ban on sales, it's important to note that the amendment did not criminalize the act of drinking alcohol itself. So if you just found it, you were good. So it comes to no surprise that the consumption of alcohol persisted, probably even more so, but at that point, it was driven into an underground market dominated by criminal figures like Al Capone. That was until the amendment's repeal in 1933. Number eight, Olympic flag debut. During the 1920 Summer Olympics held in Belgium, a significant symbol of unity was introduced to the world. High jump. No, I'm just kidding. The Olympic flag in its current form. It consisted of five interlocking rings, and these rings were chosen to represent the harmonious connection between continents and nations, and this was following the aftermath of World War I. They're like, I got it. A nice flag, but also high jump. Please high jump. The event also witnessed the release of doves. How beautiful is that? This is a powerful symbol of peace, further emphasizing this desire, this dream for global harmony in the form of high jump. <laughs> it's so funny when people come together, they're like, yes, let's do it as a unity together and all right, throw that javelin, try and beat that guy now. Good luck, break a leg. Number seven, Amelia Earhart's first flight. In the year 1897, Amelia Earhart was born, destined to make an incredible mark on aviation history. Her transformative journey began in 1920 when she had the opportunity to take her first ever airplane ride. All be as a passenger alongside the renowned World War I pilot, Frank Hawks. Now this experience proved to be quite pivotal. It ignited a deep passion within her for flight. And in her own words, Amelia expressed, as soon as we left the ground, I knew that I myself had to fly. Amelia Earhart wasted no time in pursuing her newfound ambition. She enrolled in flying lessons, displaying exceptional dedication and talent, obviously. And within a year, by 1921, she had already achieved the remarkable feat of flying solo, marking the beginning of her extraordinary journey as an aviator. I had a buddy trying to be a pilot and it took him so long. So the fact that you can do this in a year would be so good. Damn, with those like janky planes back then too, that are shaking as they're trying to get off the ground. No, that's incredible. Number six, Alexander Fleming. In September, 19. 28, Alexander Fleming, already a successful microbiologist at the time, just stumbled upon his greatest discovery entirely by chance. Must be nice. He's like, oh, we changed the world. Look at that. Upon returning to his laboratory after a well-deserved break, he observed some culture plates containing staphylococci that become contaminated with mold. And to his surprise, he noticed that the area surrounding this mold remained clear, indicating that it possessed a unique effect on said bacteria. Dubbing the strain penicillin, we love that, it's pretty good one. Fleming and his assistants embarked on a series of tests that would forever revolutionize the field of medicine. I'm like, thank you so much. Thank you, Alexander, for just looking down. That's so great. This accidental finding was hailed as the single greatest achievement in combating diseases, leading to the dawn of the antibiotic age. Again, we love that, especially today. We're like, yes, keep that up. Let's keep that science up, please. Number five, tanks. Okay, so after a few Olympics, people got tired of walking those many, many miles just to see some dudes run a mile. We need more events, said the Olympic organizers, but what? We have athletes running, what else is there? Okay, okay, I hear you. What if we get athletes to run, but with full military armor and gear on? Yeah, that's right. There was another race where athletes would wield the armor of the Greek soldiers and race. I can imagine that there was a clunking noise, or at least a lot of it, and also how difficult it must be to run in bronze armor. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. Come a little closer. A little closer, a little closer. Whoa, too close. Bronze armor isn't good for chafing. Cause let me tell you something, hot Mediterranean sun, not a lot of water and running in hot metal attire? Someone's gonna have to come over and put baby powder on my bum bum. Number four, the classic. I don't know why, but when I think of ancient Greeks, I think of grapes on the vine, marble, chariots, and, and the movie 300. It's, it's kind of hard to forget those spray on abs. Although someone could put them on me, kind of nice. Equestrian events were another event of the ancient Greek Olympics, and I have something nice to say about something for once. While every other event was dominated by males, because, well, only males were allowed to compete, of course, the equestrian events allowed women. 
face. And naturally, ladies, when someone points the spotlight on you, you shine. A notable winner of the event was Sinisica, a Spartan princess and athlete who was an excellent horse breeder. I guess that's a nice thing to be remembered by. According to some records, two monuments were built in honor of her victory. I rode a horse once. I can firmly say that I prefer the automobile. Just saying. You walk around like that, that's why all the cowboys walk like this. You just do that all that. Number three, the long jump. After running and running in armor, it was discovered that jumping makes for a great Olympic event. How high, how far? It's simple, really. It should come as no surprise that I did not perform well in that section of track and field day at school. To my disadvantage, there was no strength-based events because it was considered unhealthy for us because we were so young. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. My counter to that argument would be, why are you making tubby kids run the 1500 meter? That's liable to have the kid with asthma writing his math test in the hospital bed later. I'd probably be joining him. However, I am a supporter of the Ancient Greek jumping event. Basically, athletes gotta jump as far as they can whilst holding two large rocks. Now, if we did that today, people would know what it's like to do a long jump when grandma feeds you too much. Yeah, it's not easy. Number two, the discus, the javelin, and the hammer. Sounds like a good band. Hey, these are all events that we still compete in today. That's awesome. But doesn't it make you nervous when the athletes are throwing those bad boys around? Especially the hammer throw. God, it just makes me so nervous. While I couldn't find an exact example of an accident happening, I doubt the ancient Greeks had safety in mind for spectators. The discus was made from stone or bronze, and they were tossing those suckers the same way Guy Fieri tosses Caesar salad. Which is a lot, because he's kind of a big guy too. However, for me, it's the javelin that's most terrifying, as that was an appropriate weapon of war for the time. And athletes are just throwing them around like it's nothing. You're telling me the crowd was a safe distance away from the splash zone? Yeah, just keep your eye on the sky to be safe, folks. I don't know about that. Number one, rap battle. Honestly, this is something we should bring back to the Olympics. While I was complaining about not being able to compete in strength-based events earlier, I, as a theater kid, would have much preferred some of the other less intensive events the ancient Greeks had up to offer. The ancient Greeks were not just chucking stones and chafing in bronze armor. There was also a competition with the arts, poetry, song, and singing. Imagine if America entered Eminem into a rap battle contest. There would be no contest. Imagine if Canada entered one for musicians. KD Lang, Celine Dion, oh, and Anne Murray, just singing angels. Yeah.